and the pod the uh, there we go and the podcast will be available to stream from the helix and faculty websites so thank you christian for joining us and the floor is yours well, um, uh, thank you very much, Jane um, and uh, Justine, uh, of course, for the uh, for the invitation and the possibility to um, to talk uh, to you. I've been um, try to follow Helix uh, a little bit, and uh, I think about these uh, things I'm going to present to you uh, quite a bit. So I'd be very interested in your in your feedback and what you think about what I will present uh, to you. I'm also very happy in these times where I have the feeling that um, legal systems um, uh, drift apart uh, a little bit uh, to, uh, to reinforce uh, contacts. I had the, the privilege to, to come to the UK several times, so um, that's, that's really great. And especially in this week um, where I got very sad news uh, from uh, one person I conceived <laughs> to be very important for my uh, academic career uh, via his ideas, which is uh, James Crawford who's of course um, uh, a graduate from, from Oxford University. I think he did his um, PhD um, uh, there. And I uh, had the a privilege to join him briefly as a visiting scholar at another famous uh, university in the UK. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's very sad um, that he, um, to learn that he passed away uh, this this Monday, so uh, the initial uh, initial question um, I, I give I try to I try to frame a little bit in the way that he would ask me questions um, uh, to give me feedback. So very short uh, and provocative um, to lead you into um, to the topic of today. Sorry, I um, now I see I made uh, a mistake. I actually shared the wrong presentation but I'll correct this in a minute. Um, here we are. Yeah, this, um, I need to, to share it again. So apologies, uh, apologies for that. It's the same picture. This picture is very important for me. It in a way symbolizes um, the way that um, uh, law is reconfigured in, in digitization. So um, I never talked about these issues with um, James Crawford, but if I did, maybe he would ask me, would have asked me a provocative question uh, like um, uh, the following, is the law outpacing technology? because um, what I want to go against um, today is this um, general narrative um, that technology is moving fast and the law is, is always lagging behind. So my question is, um, uh, do we actually have legal tools and, and um, sometimes also rules that, um, that actually um, lead the way or are outpacing technology? And if you look at uh, one of the first rules on automated decision-making systems, um, uh, from, from France, so Article 2 of the first French data protection law. This is actually a good uh, example for that because at the time uh, there were no automated decision-making systems in operation. Um, uh, in their official um, justification of this act, the French referred to plans in the United States to, um, to do um, automated assessments in public administration. Um, but of course, they were worried um, about a scandal, the so-called Safari scandal, um, in which there were plans or ideas to, um, uh, to build a general database and potentially also automated decision-making systems. But uh, the technology was not ripe at all. So um, this is just a, um, a first a small provocation. Uh, is the law outpacing technology? When I, um, uh, when I look at Article um, 22, which you could open in the, in the background if you like, if you need to refer to the, to the text of this, uh, which I will explain later. But this is um, uh, the general rule on um, automated decision-making systems in the general data protection uh, regulation. And uh, the rule I will focus on when, um, when uh, talking about law by design norms, so um, norms that are maybe different from, from other ways of um, regulating and influencing technology. And in the second step, I will actually apply this uh, concept uh, to Article 22 and reinterpret uh, this provision. 
I will discuss uh, whether uh, that's actually um, a thing to do to um, uh, render this interpretation in this way and then um, conclude um, uh, hopefully some, uh, some insights from that. So uh, what are law by design norms? Um, it's uh, kind of um, a, a new um, uh, expression which has found its way into some uh, publications. But I think uh, the most prominent is, of course, Article 25 of the General Data Protection uh, Regulation. And there is similar, um, um, there are, is actually similar um, provisions in other uh, data protection um, um, rules. Uh, which uh, uh, statuates this, this obligation of data protection by design. So um, I guess that uh, most of you are familiar uh, with, uh, with that. Um, and uh, what I try to do in the next step is not to um, uh, go through this, uh, through this norm, but rather to understand how is this special and what does it do actually? Yeah, if you go to conferences, there is a big interest in privacy by, by design and data protection by design. This interest is shared by lawyers uh, and um, uh, technologists, so computer scientists, for example, programmers, um, uh, even in, in companies, it's, it's a big thing, um, this data protection by design. So how did this norm achieve this and, and what does it actually do? So my, um, uh, my summary of this, that would be that um, basically it has an interdisciplinary component by linking, um, linking a legal value um, to the design process. So it, uh, what it does is to, um, to specify a goal that um, in a way enters the design process um, uh, as do other goals. So mostly uh, computer scientists think about efficiency, they um, think about a specific functionality. And the law here says um, this is a separate design goals from the goals you also have to achieve. Another interesting aspect is the intertemporality. So um, this, um, as opposed to other rules, for example, market access rules, it's not about looking into a system at one point in time, but it's actually stretched out. Yeah? Um, the Article 25 has two points, temporal points of references. There is um, other rules that are even more open um, uh, regarding that. And uh, the third interesting aspect is that it has a goal orientation. So uh, it's not important to do certain steps to perform um, certain things that can be part of the rule, but actually what this rule does is to, to formulate um, a goal um, that has to be um, uh, achieved in the end, um, because you have to have data protection or privacy by design in the end. So I would say that um, this could be um, a general categorization of this kind of uh, norms. And the interesting thing now is uh, that if you uh, look uh, how it is to apply these norms, you come to the conclusion that it's actually different from our ordinary legal practice. So the ordinary legal practice, and I try to uh, frame this uh, in a way that it um, uh, works for uh, common law as well as, um, uh, as a continental law, um, is that you somehow have to find a rule somewhere, ascertain a rule, um, whether in case law or uh, in, uh, uh, in a codification. And then you have to uh, um, interpret uh, the content of the rule, so understand uh, what, uh, what does it say, and in a third step, uh, apply this um, to the facts uh, you're looking at. So this would be one way to try to frame uh, the structure of ordinary legal argument. And my argument is that actually when you, in, when you apply um, these design norms, the practice you do is different, is different. Because what you have to do is first assess the impacts on the goal you're looking at, for example, privacy or data protection. And then you have to come back and um, design measures that alter this impact. Um, for uh, privacy and data protection, it's specified as organizational and technical measures, but um, this is just one qualification in one law. So generally you have to uh, apply measures and then uh, when you applied those measures, you have to assess the impact again, because you have to know how does this work now um, with uh, these measures we have implemented. Um, so you assess the impact and then you go back to um, uh, design other measures, adapt them, 
uh, and so on and so forth. So basically, that's an agile uh, process. And um, if you've um, been engaged, and I'm sure um, you you have in this kind of projects, uh, that's also how this works. So it's a lot of explanation of um, finding different routes. And it's not coming from, from a specific law um, to, to one interpretation, but it's a constant um, process of adapting technologies um, and uh, adapting the legal options uh, you have in that. So uh, this would be my argument um, that uh, this is actually the practice uh, you, would, uh, you would do as a lawyer. Uh, and this um, could be done for data protection um, a law in general. But my argument is that Article 22 um, could be interpreted as such a law by design norm. Actually, uh, it has the potential to be, um, uh, to be interpreted in that way, despite the fact um, that this was not made uh, explicit uh, yet. So if you look into the structure of Article 22, there is a lot of um, uh, diverging interpretations at the moment. But if you look uh, into the structure, it's, um, it's a norm regulating automated individual decision making, including profiling. So it's not as attached to um, data protection as its forerunners, but it's rather um, outlining requirements um, for making automated decisions um, that affect or that um, focus on um, data subjects. And um, the way it does that is by um, in section one, defining a scope of application in section two, then introducing some formal requirements, which you could um, um, compare to the normal, uh, to the general um, uh, requirements in, uh, in GDPR and many other uh, data protection laws. So um, consent, um, specific uh, legal possibilities or the necessity for the performance uh, of or entering into a contract. So these are the formal requirements. And you have uh, then in section three and um, section two subsection B uh, material requirements, basically um, outlining that um, what's necessary is to, um, uh, um, to implement measures that safeguard rights, freedoms, and legitimate interests of the respective data subjects. And um, I think it's very interesting to focus on this section three, so um, uh, and actually ask what this uh, means. So if uh, I draw a parallel to um, the the structure I gave you just a few minutes ago, um, you see that um, the goals here are rights, freedoms, and legitimate interests. There is no temporal fixation, so this is generally applicable um, uh, in an intertemporal uh, manner. And um, the goal orientation is um, a quite um, is, is a, a real obligation. So there have to be suitable measures to to safeguard. So um, it's actually um, uh, quite a strict way to to frame that. And my argument is uh, that if you look into how to, um, to actually uh, oblige. Um, this is actually a law by design process. So you have to go into the design of these automated decision-making systems, not only in the technical design, but the social technical surroundings and design uh, this in a way uh, that it actually uh, can safeguard rights, freedoms and legitimate interests. So um, if you uh, revisit uh, this um, circle I try to um, argue for, you will find uh, that in the first place, uh, you have to look into how there are impacts on uh, rights, freedoms, and legitimate interests. And then you have to look for design measures or measures uh, that uh, actually can mitigate uh, this impact. Um, section three um, formulates three minimum standards that always have to be there. But um, Recital 71 um, provides uh, an, a more, um, a more uh, uh, a greater list of, um, of other measures that could be um, taken. And, um, and if you uh, implemented these measures, you would have to go back um, and assess how the system works um, with the measures you have implemented. And what I think, what I try to argue for is that um, if you apply this, 
you will um, find yourself in a different position in the way you approach problems. And this has serious consequences on, uh, on the effects of lawyers engaging in these, uh, in these processes. Because um, if I, um, and I would like to give you one example for that, which is uh, transparency and explanations because this is such an important topic and there has been a very um, um, serious and interesting legal discussion whether there is a right um, to transparency and explanations under Article 22 and Article 13, the following. But uh, I think the, um, this really highlights um, uh, the difference of such an approach because if you, um, uh, if you approach these problems from, from a perspective of legal doctrine, you do exactly what the people in this discourse have done, um, namely asking, uh, is there a right to explanation? Is there a right of, uh, to transparency in Article 22? And I think uh, that's a very um, valuable discussion and also an important issue. But maybe um, if you really apply the law, it's not uh, the most important point because um, the more important question is, uh, once you did the impact assessment and you know how this um, uh, how this automated decision making system is affecting data subjects, you have to ask is um, uh, is a transparency and exp are explanations measures that could actually um, help to mitigate these risks. And uh, once uh, you um, say yes, which is uh, the case in many instances, but not in all instances, once you say yes, um, uh, then the more interesting question even um, uh, comes up whether how you should design these measures, yeah, because um, transparency and explanation are um, important rights, um, they are part of the rule of law, but how do you implement this uh, in the specific case, uh, there is a lot of possibilities and options, and these are actually, uh, I think, um, a very important questions uh, as well, uh, that you can ask only by interacting with, uh, with technology. Um, and then you can go back to the, um, uh, to the impact assessment. So just uh, one small addition. Um, I think, of course, I think the transparency and explanation uh, will play a part in many uh, constellations. But uh, let me give you two examples in which they are not as important. First, if I know that I'm legally entitled um, to receive a certain automated decision, in many cases, um, uh, it might not be interesting for me why the automated decision-making system um, decides a certain way, but I just want uh, that um, uh, this um, decision is revised. So if you take um, a very simple example, you go to an ATM uh, and you know uh, that you have a positive balance on your account, um, uh, then actually I don't know, want to know um, why this ATM doesn't give me my money, but um, uh, the claim I make is to, to receive my money. In other cases, it might be different, but uh, it's interesting that if you know that you have the claim, then actually the transparency of um, the automated decision-making system and an explanation uh, plays no effective role. There are other constellations, especially in public administration, where you would say that external values balance out um, such a right to transparency and explanation, and you would have to have strong compensatory measures in order to balance the fact that you cannot explain certain things. So there are re um, uh, risk management systems in public administration, uh, and it's clear if you um, uh, communicate uh, the, the reasons for decisions, then the whole risk management system uh, makes no sense because it cannot um, detect fraud because everybody would know how to behave um, uh, so that uh, the, the system doesn't uh, catch uh, this, uh, certain people. Um, so in this case, you would have to have compensatory measures such as an uh, independent third party overseeing the system. And this could also be uh, one measure in uh, in the design, which uh, you can bet you can better determine when you look uh, closely interact with um, the technology. So that's my uh, my pitch to you. And now um, the question: um, Are there good arguments for this kind of interpretation? Uh, so if you approach it more from a legalistic uh, point of view, um, you could point to the wording, which I think is is open in that regard. Um, the list of measures is non exhaustive. It's only minimum measures, and uh, if you look, um, so um, um, it's um, non-exhaustive, only minimum measures. 
and if you compare it to article, um, the same applies to article um, to recital 71. And if you compare it um, to uh, to the context in article 25, uh, this uh, despite that it's more wordy, um, the basic um, idea behind this is the same. The other interesting thing is that the goals of design um, proliferate. So um, there is an increasing uh, increasing number of goals. I um, brought you here to uh, more examples from uh, from European law and um, so um, a soft obligation for transparency, uh, openness uh, by, by design, or um, uh, something that is also argued for in data protection law, IT security by design. So here you see that there is design goals and um, I think uh, the um, UK data protection law um, and interpretation of that could render even more examples because you have um, the reference to um, a child protection and standardization of um, uh, efforts uh, regarding that um, uh, in the law. So um, you could claim that this is in a way um, uh, an obligation for child protection by design because um, you have the age appropriate design codes which were, um, uh, which were uh, then drafted. Uh, so you see that there is a whole, um, uh, there is an increasing number of, of design goals on the uh, horizon. I won't go into legal history, but uh, you can clearly see that um, uh, Article 22 is different from the very defined uh, prohibitions um, uh, that were the predecessors also in European law and also part of the legislative history, which is not as important in, in European law, and I think also not in, in uh, um, the law of the United Kingdom. So let's, let's skip that and um, uh, come to what is, uh, what is important, um, which is the purpose. Um, first, it's interesting that the purpose of this norm goes beyond data protection, which uh, happens quite a lot in current data protection laws, that um, there are certain um, the goals proliferate, uh, and Article 22 is a good example of that. Um, the goal is obviously to protect uh, data subjects um, from adverse uh, consequences of automated decisions. And uh, if you look into um, the way the technology evolves, and here I um, maybe have the strongest connection to the AI um, focus uh, of your talk, you can see that um, uh, in a way, such an interpretation would link to um, uh, the time, a point in time we are in, in digitization, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence. Because, um, uh, I think that uh, AI um, is, is like a moving aim. Um, it's a um, fastly um, developing field, not only because uh, algorithms are trained and can, um, can in a way change over time, but um, because of social technical reasons, we are starting to understand what this technology uh, can do uh, and how to apply it. So there is again a temporal, um, a temporal uh, aspect of this argument which is uh, normally framed uh, as emerging technologies in technology studies, it's impossible to do an exhaustive um, technology assessment because everybody's expecting that um, there will be things we do not foresee at the moment yeah, in the use of AI. Yeah. It's the same with uh, the internet. In the 90s, nobody foresaw social media or um, e-commerce. Yeah, this is these were social technical inventions that came on top of an existing um, technical infrastructure and really changed the things that these technologies can do. And um, this could also happen with uh, with AI, which is why we have to regulate it differently and and to um, to govern it differently. Um, um, a more substantial point is the concept of general purpose technologies. AI does not have um, one purpose. It's not a technology you can use for one thing like um, uh, atomic energy for producing energy or producing energy for weapons. Yeah, but it, it fuels a whole range of applications. And um, just to give you, and this is also very important in the context of data protection, there are many um, uh, examples how AI could be used to threaten data protection in a kind of um, uh, overarching system like China social credit system. But AI can also be used to, um, uh, to protect 
um, uh, privacy. Uh, when it comes, uh, for example, to uh, recognizing um, sensitive data and uh, anonymizing it. And there is many more examples, chatbots uh, and so on and so forth. Just to give you uh, one um, quick uh, look into general purpose technologies, which I think is specifically um, important um, because uh, you have to have a constant interaction in order to keep pace. Of course, um, uh, this could prompt many critical questions. Um, which I will now not answer, but uh, just uh, just ask. So you see that uh, I'm not all for it, um, but um, uh, of course there are some problems. Um, of course, for lawyers because this is a big task uh, and a quite complex uh, task indeed. And you could also ask whether this um, stifles uh, innovation um, or. Uh, whether this context specificity is too burdensome. So um, whether this would actually um, be um, be a negative uh, or be be a downside uh, that normally you don't have with the law because the law provides um, uh, rules of general application that help you to make these decisions. So uh, maybe um, that's uh, that's also problematic. And um, the other question is whether this uh, norm becomes obsolete in the face of, of new legislation which is um, proposed. So I think I can uh, address uh, all of these issues, but um, I leave it uh, to you whether you find one or the other question uh, interesting and then maybe we can um, answer that in the discussion. But uh, let me come to my conclusion. So um, I try to um, show you with a very specific Legal, um, legal example um, that uh, there is an undiscovered design function or maybe underdiscovered design function of the law um, uh, that has a lot of potential in, in this case, but also in other cases. And um, the time did not suffice to give you a theoretical uh, grounding of this, but um, rather a specific, uh, specific example uh, that shows, um, I think, that um, these kind of, um, this regulatory technique, this, this legal technique can be one element of a toolbox to deal with these technologies, especially when we talk about emerging and general purpose um, technologies. And as I said, um, I think Article 25, uh, 22 is not recognized as, um, as such a norm. Um, but maybe um, if, um, if we put more emphasis on that and if there's more um, practice uh, also from courts and um, data protection authorities, this could be an instance where um, the law, uh, quote unquote, outpaces technology. Because I think in this, uh, in this development, um, lawyers have to um, be strategic and also rethink um, what we are doing um, uh, to come up with uh, solutions that help us to keep certain things in check. Um, so uh, as, a, as a closing uh, metaphor, um, uh, let me um, uh, introduce another hedgehog uh, story. So it's not hedgehog, uh, hedgehogs and foxes or um, uh, justice for hedgehogs, but um, the hedgehog uh, and the rabbit. Um, and uh, they had a race. Um, uh, the rabbit wanted a race with, uh, with the hedgehog and the hedgehog finally agreed, but asked his wife to, uh, which looked very similar, to be um, at, um, uh, at uh, the, the finishing line. So uh, the rabbit was of course much faster than the hedgehog, but um, another hedgehog was waiting at the finishing line. So the rabbit wanted again a race. And I think it's, it's, um, uh, this is um, a loose metaphor for what I'm proposing that uh, we um, as lawyers um, for important values take strategic positions in design processes and in a way um, try to guide uh, the development of, uh, of technologies. Even though uh, we are not faster, we can be in the important spots and uh, to stress this design function would be one, um, uh, one uh, proposal how to, how to do this. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Christian. That was that was that was a great presentation, and I'm sure that people will have lots of questions. So thank you very much. Um, is there anyone who would like to start off with a question? Okay, Justine, thank you. 
Um, so, Christian, thank you, first of all, so much for, for that fascinating talk. I, I guess maybe my question is, is a provocation. Um, I mean, do, do you, how different really do you think will be the place that we, that we would be likely to end up with if we were to approach the regulation of technology um, in the way that you suggest? I mean, wouldn't we end up just arguing about the suitability of measures to safeguard you know, a given right, freedom and legitimate interest. And I guess as a sort of analytical precursor to that, arguing about what right, freedom um, and legitimate interest actually, uh, you know, needed to be safeguarded. So we would end up, if you like, at the first point of, of the first step of, of what you presented to us as a standard doctrinal analysis. Um, I think uh, you're right in that um, uh, a doctrinal analysis uh, is part of that uh, and could be um, uh, could be um, in a way a part of that. So uh, this will not uh, this will not go away. But I think uh, if you link it to um, to the technology, you in a way um, have this other point of reference which um, puts more flesh on the uh, on the question. So um, uh, in a way, you have a specific situation in which you can, uh, in which you can uh, argue and you can link it to, um, uh, to, this, uh, to this question. So in a way, I don't think that um, uh, all our legal doctrine is, is different, but there is some addition to that. And um, as I tried to show you with um, the question of transparency, um, so what I'm in a way presupposing is um, uh, that um, that there is a dynamic reference to existing um, rights, freedoms, and uh, legitimate interests, and uh, that there can be at some point um, uh, a decision about what these are. But what I'm arguing against is, and you can really see this from this discourse about transparency, is that it's not important to look into Article 22 and um, its legislative history to determine that, but rather to focus on uh, the specific situation you are faced with in order to determine the situation. And then um, you really talk about impacts and about um, the way um, things change when you implement certain measures. So I think um, uh, this in a way also makes the legal discussion more um, informed by um, uh, informed by by specific um, uh, specific uh, things that data subjects um, uh, are really faced with yeah and um, I think it, it would help or it has the potential um, uh, to help us to reach more rational decisions because I'm quite worried um, that this um, discussion will take over and we will talk about everything that is not mentioned um, along the way in, in Article 22 and Recital 71, as opposed to um, taking the, the rights that we already have and looking how we can work with technologies in order to, to make systems better. Thank you. Thank you. Genevieve. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, expose. Enjoyed it very much. You briefly mentioned that there was no time really for the theoretical underscoring or the theatrical background or a theory that informs your arguments. And I wonder if there are no other questions, whether you still could go into that a little bit. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, so uh, there is uh, uh, there is different ways of um, of approaching uh, approaching that. Uh, one way that I outlined a little bit is um, um, an old um, theory in, in social science, but uh, still uh, prevalent in comparative law. So to try to um, understand the functions the law has, so um, the goals it reaches, and to to relate this and to uh, frame design as a specific function. So this would be something you could build out of, uh, of the law also in a more theoretical manner. Um, but I think the more exciting, um, uh, exciting course is to look into what uh, design means. Um, uh, because design has started as a, a rather narrow, um, narrow field um, of um, of analyzing um, the functions of artifacts, but now is broadening um, uh, to, um, to a, 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 a broader, um, broadening to a general idea of how to approach questions also as a scholar. So, um, uh, which uh, in a way um, uh, highlights um, the fact uh, that um, things are 
are in flow and um, and can be uh, can be seen in, in very different ways and uh, one thing that was uh, very enlightening for me in that regard is um, constructivism uh, as it was also translated in um, so science and technology studies starting with uh, Wiebke Baiker uh, but also uh, many others um, so the appreciation of um, actually how far we actually make technology. And I think we lawyers are in a, in a great position to, uh, to give very specific examples um, for, um, for these um, currents of uh, constructivism, because it makes all the difference whether I say, um, as a lawyer, we can say um, I, in German administrative law, there is a rule saying, um, allowing for um, automated uh, decisions as administrative acts and um, uh, other rules linking to that rule actually have the performative function that this is not then existing laws. Yeah? For example, if you take um, intelligent traffic systems, speed bands or uh, overtaking bands or speed limits uh, in a way turn into the law. Yeah? Um, uh, and uh, we, um, the law does this. Yeah? So, um, and this, uh, this opens up a whole range of, uh, if you think about technology like this, this, of course, goes a little bit um, against uh, technical determinism. This opens up a whole range of, of possibilities. And then the question is, what do we do? So assume um, uh, that uh, we accept um, uh, the, the ideas of, um, of uh, constructivism in, in SDS. What could we do with that? Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, if, if I accept that, I could say, well, the law could be actually uh, a way to guide these um, um, to guide these processes, to um, to democratize them. Um, uh, STS looks a lot into participation, but I think there is a lot of potential to say actually the law can uh, can influence this and can um, can make certain processes manageable. Yeah? And uh, this is just fasc fascinating for me to to try to combine um, uh, constructivism in STS um, with, uh, with the law um, in, in these um, social technical settings. And this would be a touch, uh, so in this case, Article 22 could be a touch point um, to, uh, to uh, trying to make things manageable or um, to, to um, make things more, uh, more flexible, yeah? Having said that, um, some people disagree. Um, there's metaphors like the iron cage of the law. Um, I, but I think if you approach this from a constructivist perspective, you would also say, well, the law is also um, a mate <laughs> to a large extent. And um, I think to think this together uh, opens up a whole range of possibilities, especially when you stress these design situations in which you do not take an artifact as a given, but really see how it's, uh, how it's made of. Yeah? So that's, um, uh, I hope this was, um, uh, this was, uh, uh, so clear that you, you can grasp the, the, the general idea where I'm coming from, but uh, this uh, would be one, uh, one idea how to link this um, to, to a, um, a theoretical discourse. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Maybe one small follow-up question. Could you spell the name of the German author on uh, constructivism? I'm not sure whether I understood you. Um, Wiebke Baika, I'll, um, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, I prepared um, uh, some things uh, which I will now share um, um, if, if, if you're interested from me, but um, I'll double check uh, the name of Wiebke Baika and as soon as I um, uh, have it, uh, I'll, um, uh, I'll put it in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if I could just comment on that, I mean, it's not a question, Christian, actually, it's just a comment. I, I, I like that very much. I mean, people often talk about uh, digital technologies, um, particularly having a certain trajectory, crudely from utopian to dystopian project in virtue largely of corporate capture. But what I like about, you know, your use of constructivism here is that it, it introduces this idea of legal capture. If the law can come in and somehow uh, capture the technology at a certain point in its, well, I guess, you know, in, in, it, in its uh, design, then it has the possibility also of blunting um, the effects of other regulatory, non-legal regulatory mechanisms like the market and, and, and what have you. So I don't know if you've thought about it also in those terms, but I think that's very nice, actually. 
No, I, I think that's a very good, um, uh, very good uh, connection. Yeah, um, uh, very good uh, connection to um, to link it also to other regulative um, uh, mechanisms, and to see that. Uh, maybe things are more interrelated. Uh, I think uh, also markets. Yeah, um, of course, uh, there is a big intersection with uh, with the law as well, and many uh, many things in which um, lawyers try to or actually do influence um, uh, how uh, markets uh, regulate things. And um, why don't we do the same things for um, for technology in a more um, in, a, in a way uh, to tr uh, trying to influence them? Yeah. Uh, Maybe uh, one addition. So um, I think um, uh, also to your um, uh, to your f uh, question before, uh, what I didn't say is that um, even with such a design approach, there would be um, uh, a lot of potential to um, to generalize certain things, uh, which happens in standardization or with other regulations. So uh, if I know that for a class of applications, um, uh, these are the impacts uh, I should look into. Uh, then I can uh, I can also take this uh, to a certain extent, and um, uh, if there are no other risks involved, involved, um, take this as a um, uh, as a further measure. But um, uh, of course, uh, there can always be new applications which uh, I would then have to um, uh, to look into uh, separately. Yeah. Any? Thank you for that. Any other questions? So much. Yes, Shamila. Hi. Well, thank you for that, Christian. And thank you for having me, Jane, and everyone. Um, <clears throat> my question comes from a more practical perspective as a biomedical researcher in precision medicine. Okay, so forgive me because um, here in Brazil, we are having these digital transformation, especially in the uh, national health system, which holds like the data from approximately 200 million people. And I have been hearing a lot of talks because I have worked as a consultant to the Ministry of Health about how we can develop by design um, according to, I mean, following this example that you gave from China. So either incentives or punishment. There's a lot of punishment talks and I'm always the one um, advocating for incentives. Um, so there is something like for lifestyle related diseases. So like cancer and I mean, I work with thyroid cancer prevention and diagnostic genetic diagnostics to run like cost-effective diagnosis of large family cohorts. And because we are having this digital transformation and people want to have like environmental and patient reported data and outcomes, there is a very um, disruptive opportunity for people to implement punishment um, measures for people who do not comply with you know, improvement or certain types of behavior. Um, also, when it comes to uh, automatizing uh, genetic counseling, for example, so not only genetic pre and post-test genetic counseling, but also the follow-up counseling using mm. these patient reported data and also the clinical follow-up because we are now under the COVID-19 and a lot of people are within um, intelligent digital environments, but also intelligent in-person environments. So some of the private hospitals, they are implementing these automatization of in-person and digital telemedicine and e-health. Um, so it's, I hear a lot of talks about uh, punishment and I would really want to learn more about how we could do it as an, um, well, you know, the other, the other side of the coin. 
Okay, thank you. It's a very blunt question. But... No, 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 not at all. It's it's a great uh, it's a great question. Uh, first, uh, it um, it highlights an important fact, if I may, that I am um, add to um, uh, Justine's question. So, Justine, your questions are so good that I always take another question to to come back uh, to them. So, um, uh, if you um, uh, if you allow. Um, that's my observation, which is why I think you gave a great example. So um, in a way, um, uh, the law and technology merge. So um, I, I think in the 90s, we always discussed about and, and the um, zero years, we discussed about uh, these new forms of regulation, which in a way um, were um, uh, like a, a separate thing. Um, to the law, but um, one observation um, that I made and that I would like to focus um, on um, uh, or that I'm focusing on qu uh, quite now is how these um, uh, technologies actually become media for the law and, and in a way reinforce the possibilities. And uh, it's really, um, I think you gave a great uh, example for that because um, things that I could never regulate, yeah, I can now regulate by incentives and in a way roll out to the population. And actually the social credit system is just that. So at the moment they are creating laws and then um, trying to build these um, incentives and punishments um, for, uh, for the people. And I think at the moment uh, we, um, uh, the, the regulations I've seen do not really know how to deal with that and where, um, uh, where the limits are. Um, uh, Shamila, um, uh, which is uh, why I think and health is just a great, um, a great example because you always have this paternalistic um, uh, excuse, of course, in saying where well, we do this uh, for the for the health of the people. But um, so at the moment there is a regulation, um, a proposal for a regulation in the European Union, and they really struggled with that. Yeah, they in a way wanted to have in Article Five uh, one section on. Um, that in a way outlaws um, uh, uh, general systems of um, observing people and then uh, creating uh, incentives and punishments. But um, they found that many things that uh, insurances want to do and, and other uh, stakeholders, especially in the health sector, want to do uh, would actually be forbidden by this. So they, they kind of uh, tried to water it down yeah, with, to say that um, uh, it cannot be out of context um, it has to be proportionate uh, and uh, and things like uh, things like that. So um, from from the perspective that I presented uh, to you today, I cannot give you a ready-made solution, but we have to think about um, the legal values we actually want to put into the um, into the system that could speak to the problem uh, you you were facing. And in the research we did um, in the medical sector, we came up with um, the the value of autonomy. Uh, patient's autonomy and autonomy of people. So if we came up with a good way to put this into the design, yeah, this could be, um, uh, could be uh, one factor to mitigate um, uh, what you've just said, because if we say the patient still, um, there might be um, uh, advantages and disadvantages for the, for the patient, but if we have this benchmark of um, the self-determination of, uh, of the patient. If we had this, yeah, um, then there would be still uh, room to, um, to give incentives or, um, or I wouldn't say, like legally you wouldn't say punishments, but um, um, this disadvantages. In certain cases, maybe even punishments. Yeah? Um, so uh, this would be the crucial question. So how can we, um, how can we do this with autonomy? And uh, the good thing that, um, or the good thing about these design questions is that you create incentives for the people doing the tech to actually take care of this. Yeah, this is what happened in data protection because um, it's one thing as a lawyer to, uh, to go in these projects and to, um, uh, to be part of it. But normally you're always the showstopper. Yeah, you always, you say, this is not working. Yeah, <laughs> Justine, you know that. <laughs> and that's not working. And the people, you know, um, they try to exclude you from the meetings. Yeah, some you find out, oh, there's a meeting. I wasn't invited. Yeah, and um, this is what, uh, what happens. So how can we create incentives um, uh, first for people to take these values up? And this is what happened by privacy by design. So there is a privacy enhancing technology is a discourse that came out of computer science and a lot of people working on it, doing innovations, uh, furthering the scope. Um, 
Uh, so it's cool for them. And um, also you, um, you can then come in and mitigate and uh, in a way negotiate. Yeah? You say, maybe um, we'll, um, we'll accept this um, punishment but uh, maybe they have an, um, um, we, we do other measures. Yeah, we, we uh, create an opt out, uh, we, um, we create an alternative um, uh, or uh, just a general, general scheme where people wouldn't have the benefits, but also not the punishments or things like that. So we open up um, the, the possibilities for that. But uh, yeah, I think uh, this is really an interesting, uh, interesting um, field. Uh, there are first little signs of this um, autonomy by design you see in the health sector. So um, just to give you one example in the German health regulation, which I'm most familiar with. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> um, but just one. Um, so what they um, determined recently is the funding of apps as medical devices. So um, that your doctor could actually um, uh, uh, um, uh, say that uh, you use an app and this is refunded. And um, there were certain quality criteria to define that. And um, patient sovereignty was, was one of the uh, criteria. So maybe by also defining quality criteria, this could be an inroad um, to, um, uh, to uh, link these, uh, these values also in the, in the medical sector and, um, and uh, help to, to put this also as a, as a design goal. Um, uh, in order to uh, to have this somehow in the in the picture, yeah? because um, these these systems have a big influence, yeah, um, uh, and uh, so I think it's a really interesting interesting field and interesting question. If you want to reach out afterwards, do not hesitate. Um, uh, we we've done a little bit of work on that. Uh, would be uh, if, if we can help in any case. Um, yeah, do not hesitate. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. Christian, I, I, I'm, I'm going to jump in here because um, I really like the idea of law by design. And I think GDPR is quite an interesting example because it's very much about process. When you think about what's, what's, in, what's in the regulations, it's very much about process in a way of, of really setting up ways in which uh, the criteria and, and the ways in which data should be processed. What I'm interested in is I, I was kind of struck by your diagram of, dia of, of the arrows going around with technology and law. And so, and sort of my question really is, at what point, what, what is the trigger for thinking about changes in the law? So we know that the GDPR is uh, it, it takes us along one way of understanding the use of data. But are there, what will be the trigger? Will it, will it be technology that will trigger this kind of reiterative cycle of kind of thinking about the law and changing it? I mean, how, how, does, how does law by design help us here? You know, do, how, does, how does it kind of enable us to, to really have that dynamic interaction? And, and are there things in the law that we should have in the law to enable that um, process of, of thinking about the law to, to go on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good, um, uh, that's a very good question because um, also you're highlighting that um, I think uh, this privacy by design only works in a good institutional environment because you have the enforcement, you have um, a quite detailed, uh, detailed regulation of um, which um, uh, standards should, should be um, in there. Uh, and on top of this, um, uh, you implement such a, um, a design norm that uh, then broadens, uh, broadens this um, even. Um, so uh, I think um, it's, uh, I haven't thought about, um, uh, about the triggers, but I think it's um, actually, it's an instrumental question for me because um, uh, I, um, I think about uh, how we could, um, how this could also be, become a part of the legislative um, toolbox uh, we use in these, uh, in these settings. So maybe one way to answer your question would be to go back into, um, uh, into what were the triggers so far. Um, 
uh, and then uh, what should be uh, what should be the triggers. But I think um, uh, so, um, and maybe um, so. Uh, I think uh, with uh, with privacy, this re really came out of of a community and an understanding that um, the interaction of society and technology um, uh, creates, um, a prob um, creates a challenge uh, that can be, um, uh, can be solved uh, by, um, by designing this, um, at, at maybe can only be solved by um, des designing this technology in a more um, holistic, uh, holistic manner. And um, because it's, it's very hard to um, to regulate from start to finish how to um, uh, to process data in all aspects yeah that's uh, that's almost impossible it can be so many um, uh, so many ways so maybe this might be a um, might be two triggers actually one is the complexity of the situation so situations of a very complex um, um, or possibilities with many uh, issues of balancing and um, the other uh, manifest societal need um, that can be related to technology in a clear uh, in a clear manner. So this this might be very abstract um, uh, triggers. Um, if you think more concretely, it could be a first step uh, in the regulation in the sense of um, uh, highlighting a problem, flagging a problem, um, and um, tr trying to translate this also. Um, uh, in an interdisciplinary manner, um, uh, and this would be the not the um, example of data protection, but um, of uh, openness and transparency. So this was done for public administrations um, to tell them because um, there were several legal measures for um, opening up the data in public administrations, but somehow they always find a way, found a way to um, um, to go around this. Um, and now, um, uh, I think together with the, the idea of, um, uh, of uh, highlighting that this is a good thing, thing which uh, is a multi-stakeholder process, um, the um, Open Government Coalition, um, uh, comes this design, uh, these first signs of transparency by design that actually um, uh, communicate also on a specific level that you have to, um, it's a very lofty obligation, but it's a start to, um, to uh, communicate this also that it's, it's a legal obligation to do that. So um, here it's more of, a, um, of um, the start of, of a conversation um, uh, in which uh, a goal should be, uh, should be achieved. So I'm not sure whether I, um, uh, I really uh, got the gist of, of uh, the question, but um, uh, I think what I understood um, uh, triggers of, of legislation, I think is a good, um, is a good uh, question. And I would have to look deeper into, um, first maybe look deeper into what uh, triggered, triggered them to, um, uh, to then expand on, on that. Thank you, Christian. Um, we've actually come to time, but I'm sure that uh, Christian would be happy to stay on the call and um, uh, talk to people if they had further questions. I just want to give a shout out to our colleagues from Japan, Argentina and Turkey and just to say how it's uh, thank you so much for uh, coming along today. And um, I just wanted to thank Christian again for his presentation. So I will clap and you can if you want, but thank you very much. Thank you.